Welcome to Courtroom Confidential's International Spotlight segment. I'm very excited to bring you this segment live from Mauritius, which is an island off the eastern coast of Africa. Mauritius is often thought of as a very popular vacation destination um, for Asians and Europeans alike. And I'm very honored to welcome as our guest to the show, Mr. Neil Kaplan. Um, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. Yes. Um, just to get by way of background, now Neil is here to give his perspective on Mauritius and the greater role the country is playing with regards to foreign direct investment into Africa and to talk about the MCCI Arbitration and Mediation Center and his involvement with it. Now, I understand that um, you have been involved in putting Hong Kong on the international arbitration landscape and making it the leading go-to premier destination for arbitration in Hong Kong. Um, and despite your busy calendar, you've taken an additional role or taken on an additional role as president of the Mark Court. How did you come to be involved with the Mark? I think it was three years ago that uh, Mauritius hosted the ICCA ICA conference here, or Congress here, which I was very pleased to attend. And uh, during one of the sessions, somebody from Mauritius offered me a lift back to my hotel, locked the doors of his very expensive car, and wouldn't let me get out until I'd agreed to uh, assist Mark in moving up to a new level using my experience in Hong Kong. So that's how I got involved, and I gave them a few ideas. We had meetings. And, uh, and I came back for a, a session with them a few months later. And then last year we had our first Mark um, arbitration week and we've published the rules, the new rules. And, and um, well, we've had two arbitration weeks. This is the second. So uh, that's how I got involved. Now, I just wanted to explain why this person was probably as persistent as they were and to take advantage of the opportunity they met with you to get you to come over here. Um, you're known as the, the, the father of arbitration in Hong Kong. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you sort of rose to that title? Well, I think you only rise to a title like that by longevity. Um, I went to Hong Kong in 1980. Uh, I was practicing as a barrister in London and I happened to be a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in London. And when I arrived in Hong Kong to work for the Attorney General, who was somebody I knew from the bar in England, uh, arbitration was a big topic. So he assumed I knew everything about arbitration because I was a fellow of the Chartered Institute. And so he handed me a number of things to do to represent the government on deciding whether or not we should adopt the model law, whether or not we should amend the ordinance, the statute, and how, and whether or not we should set up an arbitration center. And when we did set up an arbitration center, I was very much involved with that, was an original council member, and uh, took over as chairman in 1991, I think. So um, that's how I got involved in arbitration, and I was the judge from 1990. Uh, of the in charge of the construction and arbitration list and then I retired from that in 1995 and for the last 25 years basically I'll be doing international arbitration. Amazing. I mean you are probably one of the most well-known figures in international arbitration so it's really impressive. I mean I know you don't you probably you raise your eyebrows a little bit but you truly are so I think it's great that, that you're so involved with the mark and trying to elevate help them elevate their status here um, over in Africa. Now, you know, what makes the mark an attractive arbitration and mediation center for foreign investors in Asia, in your opinion? Well, I think, first of all, uh, Mauritius is a very stable country. Um, it is uh, democratic and uh, it respects the rule of law and it has uh, an able and independent judiciary. And what's relevant to what I'm about to say is it has designated judges who are uh, experienced in arbitration, who deal with all cases involving arbitration that get to the court. So the legal infrastructure is in good, good state. Um, Mauritius, of course, uh, sees itself as a neutral uh, venue for disputes involving Africa. Um, Mauritius sees itself as part of Africa, 
although it's quite a long way in distance from parts of Africa, it's much nearer to the southeast of Africa. Um, and, but it's certainly in that in that position, and uh, it has a legal system which is a blend of English common law and French. Um, and it's of course a centre uh, for investment and a centre for corporate identity. Uh, so we thought that MCCI, which has been established since about 1850, so it's one of the oldest um, uh, chambers of commerce in the world. I know that. <laughs> well, there you are. There, you should come to your own podcast more often. <laughs> um, it was about time it set up an arbitration arm, which it did, uh, called Mark M A R C, about ten years ago, and um, so I was asked to come along and try and help Mark uh, move up to another level using the experience I'd gained from, you know, setting up and developing Hong Kong. And um, so what we've done is we've um, we set up a, a court, Mark Court. And this, the membership of the court is, is is full of distinguished people from Lord Newberger, a recently retired Supreme Court um, uh, judge in England, um, uh, former Attorney General or Solicitor General of India, former Solicitor General of, pa of Attorney General of Pakistan, and uh, so many other distinguished people. I can't remember them all, but believe me, they are all top class. So the court will appoint arbitrators. The court will decide on challenges to arbitrators, and will decide what other other tasks are assigned to it by the new Mark rules. So anyone who comes to arbitrate in um, Mauritius under the Mark rules knows that the whole process is going to be overseen by a completely independent and able court. And I understand that, that the, uh, that's one of the highlights I've heard sort of throughout the day is that Mauritius and specifically the mark is going to be able to offer neutrality more so than some of the other perhaps arbitration centers, their, their competitors throughout Africa. Well, it's, I'm not prepared to comment on what happens in other parts of Africa. All I can tell you is that uh, Mark appoints uh, arbitrators uh, as a result of discussions between members of the court, drawing on its vast experience. It will deal with challenges. So what I'm getting at really is that the court will exercise uh, neutrality. Uh, none of the members of the court have any connection with Mauritius. So anyone coming here to choose Mauritius as an arbitral venue will know that there's this built-in um, um, impartiality. And uh, what we then did, of course, was to uh, uh, draft a new set of cutting-edge rules for arbitration, uh, which were opened up for, uh, published last year, and they've just been translated into Chinese, thanks to the help of Arthur Ma, who I think you've spoken to as well. Yes, a little bit ago. <laughs> and um, these rules are cutting edge. I mean, to be quite frank, we have drawn very heavily on the experience in Hong Kong and to some extent in Singapore, because there's no point in reinventing the wheel with these things. But we've added a lot of new provisions. I mean, we've added a provision that allows parties to opt in to an appeal procedure if they think it's appropriate. We have provisions for um, blind appointments to stop unconscious bias. And uh, we made a very important uh, rule that says the arbitration award shall be succinct and there's no need to set out the procedural history or the party's cases in full unless it's necessary to do so. Because there's a lot of criticism about the length of awards and the longer an award is, the longer it takes and the more expensive it is. Right. So with all that, do you foresee the mark, or I says Mauritius in general, um, becoming the sort of the Hong Kong or Singapore um, of Africa in terms of becoming the arbitration hub? Well, it's very difficult in these times to guess what's going to happen in the future. There are a number of things that have happened recently that none of us would have uh, anticipated, I venture to suggest. Uh, so what do I think about the... All I can say is uh, Mark has got everything in place that it needs to have. Um, you know, if Mark had an un 
unlimited budget to go around the world to promote itself and in Africa, I think things would happen a lot quicker. But the reality is very few places have this uh, unlimited resources. Um, there are a couple in Asia that uh, uh, the countries have been throwing money at their arbitration centers and the, it, it, is, it is born fruit. So I think we just have to wait and see. Uh, obviously, arbitration centers are somewhat parasitic in the sense that they have to wait, firstly, for their clauses to be inserted in contracts, and then they have to wait for those contracts to go sour before there's a dispute. And of course, in a perfect, lovely world, nothing would ever go wrong and there'd be no disputes at all. But unfortunately, that we don't live in a perfect world. So I, all I can say is I think Mark's got everything in place and uh, it needs promotion, it needs understanding, it needs people to, to, to know about it and to know the full nature of what it has to offer. And uh, that's, that's quite a, an uphill battle, it takes time. And as I said in my opening remarks this morning, uh, we need time, patience and, and, and a, de a good deal of hope. Last question. The theme for today was a bridge, Mauritius as a bridge between Asia and Africa. I mean, if you look around the island, there's a lot of evidence of Chinese investment growing and growing influence in Mauritius. Uh, Mauritius is also a huge supporter of China's One Belt, One Road initiative. You see that sort of everywhere. Um, and further, China is you know one of Mauritius' main trading partners in terms of imports. Now, um, does this make the case that Mauritius could be the needed, <clears throat> the needed proverbial bridge from Africa to, to, to China and Asia. Well, I think the point you have to bear in mind here is that the arbitration clause is just as negotiable as any other clause in the contract. And of course, when a Chinese party is negotiating with a, an African party, the Chinese party will say any disputes have to be dealt with in Beijing. If the African party doesn't give in and says, no, 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 we can't accept that, we need neutrality, uh, how about, uh, you know, somewhere, somewhere else, you know, then Mauritius will come in as a, as a viable option. Of course, I'm wearing my other hat, the Chinese party will probably say, how about Hong Kong? And uh, so that, that's how it, it often comes to be. But the Mauritius, sorry, the African party may say, well, no, we think Hong Kong uh, is too close to China, which is not true actually, but physically it's quite true, uh, and so they might decide on somewhere else. But obviously Mauritius is going to be in play in all those discussions, and all I, I can't tell you how those discussions are going to end. But I think a, a lot of them will end favorably to Mauritius as long as Mauritius keeps up its game and keeps the cutting edge of uh, arbitral uh, legislation and uh, its rules and practice. And the more successful arbitrations we have here, uh, the more people will know about it and be more relaxed about choosing Mauritius as a venue. Putting aside the fact that it's a very nice place to be. It's gorgeous here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is amazing here. Um, thank you, Neil, so much for being our guest today. Um, you know, I wish we had more time because it's such an honor to sit here and have this conversation with you. Um, and thank you to all of our Court and Confidential listeners. Um, this is your host, Tara Shaw, wishing you all a great day and from beautiful Mauritius. Thank you. Mm -hmm.